So I have one little thing that when I watched it through the second time that I wish they would have just done slightly differently. And it's so horrible that I'm saying this, but Mm -hmm. I wish her death was like, she was like a little bit more violent with her death in a way. Cause like if, when we, when we look at all the deaths on game of Thrones, like when people get stabbed in the gut, like a, a killing blow to the gut, there's a little bit more blood that comes out of the mouth. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. Yeah, they took it pretty easy with... <laughs> I mean, it's just like this beautiful little dribble of blood, like... Yeah, two perfect streaks. It was like... too perfect for me, and it was beautiful. And don't get me wrong, I loved it. It was poetic. It was beautiful. It was done the way they felt that it needed to be done, but I felt like she should have, like, coughed up some blood and have, like... Sure, she was trying to fight it a little. Yeah. Like she I just was more wishing that she had a last word or something. Yeah. Like I really oh, hope man. that she that had, had been crazy. one thing to say or that was the only thing. The only thing about it that upset me was that she didn't say anything. Oh. She was just totally shocked. She's like, I forgive you. <laughs> kind of like Jorick didn't couldn't say anything to her in his yeah. last dying moments. Yeah. But I just wish it was just a little bit more like realistic to the show when people get stabbed in the gut. Like, yeah, shit flies out. I of think every that he stabbed orifice. upwards <laughs> from her um, solar plexus into her heart. And I think what he did was basically sever her aorta like instantly, which results in like, oh, yeah, she bled out. Yeah, like completely. immediate, right near away. immediate death. That's what Dexter does is he severs the aorta of his victims for the killing mm. stroke, <laughs> which is like near instant Jesus. death. <laughs> what? I, can't, I mean, I totally brought this up. Like, I just, it's so funny that we're talking about like, <laughs> I wish she would have died more violently. <laughs> <laughs> it's so like awful for me to say. Very Cersei of you. I know. God damn. <laughs> I don't want to be like Cersei. It was just one of those like. Sure. I wish just something they could have done a little differently. I, like, oh, I wish it was just a little bit more um, visceral. Dirty. No, I yeah. totally get that. Sure. Like, I just wish he had another word. I wish, you know, it, it just seems like it should have been more impactful. Like, just. I thought it was perfect. Yeah. I mean, I loved I it know. the way it was. That's it was, my only it was thing great. That I kind of said too. Sure. I thought it was great. About it, but uh, the only thing I would have said was it should, it, it was so freaking fast. Yeah. Just so fast. I know. And that's, that's yeah. the other cool thing about it is that he knew he needed to act and he needed to act now. And every yeah. second that he delays, Grey Worm could be walking up behind him or something could be happening. Like he acted well fast, you know? Mm-hmm. The second that she, said that they would not have a choice, which is exactly what Tyrion said. They didn't get to choose their fate. You know, like oh, that yeah, was you're totally right. That was what let John know Tyrion is right and he had to do it. And it has he, to happen now. Yeah, it ha- or never. Yeah. Tonight's the night and it has to happen. Yeah. So I mean that's just my one tiny t- it's a teeny tiny little like, ew, I just wish it was a little bit Sure, sure. Oh man. <laughs> It's it's so crazy, though. He's holding her there and crying, and he's obviously so sad about this. Like, he loves her and doesn't want to have to do this, but he's forced to do it just because, like... He couldn't believe it happened. I don't think he could believe he even did it. Yeah, I agree. The look on his face just looked like, oh, my God, this just happened. Yeah, and he's he's crying as the John and Danny theme plays sadly. And after a couple seconds, you hear Drogon stirring from outside which reminds him and you see him yeah too. he flies past it's like he knows something's wrong and he's just trying to locate exactly where it where it is right so he, he it's crazy too because john knows that drogon is coming but still he doesn't leave danny's body he holds I think on he was to planning her, to die by drogon oh yeah die with danny yeah i mean yeah it's it seemed like it you know like in a sort of jamie-esque way he was ready to go out with with her um, or that would be his sacrifice. Like, I did what had to be done. Yeah. Take me. So Drogon, like, flies by and then figures out where they are and lands and starts crawling over the rubble into the room. And John slowly lays Danny to rest on the floor and sort of starts backing away. And as Drogon, Drogon's, like, whining almost, like, you know, like a low-pitched, sad sound that tells John, like, get out of my way, dude, you know? <laughs> 
and it's the fucking saddest ever as Drogon is nudging her body. But yeah, the way oh, that he so horrible. and sad music is playing and the way he grills John and just like stares at him and like he just looks so mad. Like he's He goes through so many emotions in like one moment. Ugh. Like he like looks at him, he like his eyebrows fur and then he they get back up and then he smells her. I don't know how they did that. That I don't know. And then his eyes kind so of like cool. darken, like he, he kind yeah. of like frowns and they kind of open up again yeah, and, and he like cocks back his head like Viserion did <laughs> just like two episodes ago when John was in danger in the courtyard at Winterfell and he's he's looking down Drogon's throat as the flames are shining from within like you can see them start to rise and he's just ready for death basically and he like steals himself and looks down at Danny and Looks like he's just ready for it, and then Drogon just fires at the throne instead. It's just, whoa. And what a visual shot that was. Oh my god. Yeah, the, god. the tendrils of the top of the throne, the sword points melting down to the sides. And and he was just going, like puking, puking flames. He was so mad. Over and over. And over. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and he lets out such a, a, a cry of, you know, agony and... Like when he realizes that she's dead, he stands up and holds his wings out and just like, Rah! like people for miles must have been like, oh shit, what happened? Because that did not sound good. You know what I mean? No. And then again, they see like a burst of dragon fire coming out of the red keep. Right. I mean, I'm sure yeah. like the Dothraki and the Unsullied below, we didn't really get to see any of like the aftermath of that. But I mean, you're probably like, what that the fuck? was clearly visible from, you know, far away, considering it was high up in the, in the tower. Oh, yeah. And I just loved watching that throne melt away. I thought it was very fitting because the image of this season is Drogon oh, as kind the of throne. staring down onto the throne. Yeah, it's like or, yeah, Drogon like overlaid onto the throne with like his spikes being the, the throne mm -hmm. spikes. Damn. Mm -hmm. So I thought that that was Connecting like... Connecting Drogon and the throne, like showing that there would be some important connection with the two. Yeah, and... And like just, the one thing that you could think of that would melt the throne. Yeah, it took a dragon to make it. Yeah, it took yeah, a dragon yeah. to destroy what a dragon made. And yeah. it's both Jon and, and Drogon, you know. It and took, it was Danny. Yeah, I mean, it, it had took... To be Danny. Right, it took Jon to, to eliminate Danny, and it took Drogon to eliminate the throne. And this is where the wheel... Breaks. This Oops. is the sacrifice Oops. that John made, you know, and the sacrifices Danny made to get herself there. Yep. And all the horror that, you know, kind of came about because of it. You know, the wheel is broken. And then we get Bran the Broken. <laughs> yeah. When you think no one else, like none of them could have taken the throne, none of them could have made it the way it should have been. Yeah. It had to be destroyed. It sh it could not be a throne. Right. That's what, something couldn't. I've been saying for a long time. Like, the throne can't exist at the end of this. Like, it can't. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And I was, I've been worried about having any dragons exist as well, but at least Drogon seems to, um, you know, have flown away. And maybe Bran can keep a hold on him, keep him from killing people or something. Or at least keep an eye on him. Just make sure he's not yeah. going crazy so that pretty much wraps up my number two anything else you guys want to add about that john and danny the death of daenerys targaryen mm. wow oh yeah. that was crazy to see that. that was like an hour <laughs> <laughs> yeah so good so, so what's good. your number one princess sarah um my number one was um, how much we love ghost and how much John loves ghosts. Yes. <laughs> Yay, nice. That was ghost. so important to me. Yeah, me too. I was really happy to see um, that ghost and John are finally reunited and in good fashion this time. Like we actually see John, them like, you know, like nuzzle up with each other and stuff like that, you know? Well, I was I worried know. they kept like doing the shots of him, you know, up on the, you know, the little terrace and it just kept showing John and I was like, where's Ghost? Right, where's oh Ghost? God, where's I kept Ghost? saying that to Dave. They do like, not show Ghost, we're going to have ghost? a problem. We're going to have a major that problem. when I turn. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Ghost. I was like, oh, thank God. Thank you. And then we hear, him, we hear him whine and I'm like, yes! Yeah, you see, hear him before yes! you see him. Exactly.
was so happy. That made, I mean, if nothing else, that made the episode. Because <laughs> it was just so, it was so perfect. Because that felt more fitting to me than a lot of the other pieces that may or may not have fallen together. That <laughs> felt like, sure. okay, we are getting this together. And they really do care about how the fans feel. Yeah. And how John would feel, how you know the story should be maybe ending. maybe it was just too hard for john to say goodbye at winterfell he just couldn't do it he had to leave <laughs> otherwise mm, he would have cracked into a million pieces um but yeah i still don't like the way he left ghosts but i'm glad that they have been reunited yeah and that he had he's they've forgiven it you know he's forgiven john apparently <laughs> if, if ghost can forgive john so can i <laughs> um, well, maybe Bran warped into a Ghost and said, "Hey, John's coming anyway. <laughs> maybe, Don't worry." <laughs> yeah, maybe it's entirely possible. Should we just talk about that Castle Black scene while we're uh, while we're there? Sure. Nice. We get one horn blast as we, which is the you know the universal signal of Rangers returning, and we get two of those two guys that were escorting him from from the dungeon and um john looks weary as he arrives at castle black and tormund looks down from atop one of the um the walkways and it, like the look on his face it looks like is if like as if he's sorry that after everything that's happened john has been banished to to the wall again you know that's like kind of the look i got from it or the the vibe mm -hmm. i got from it mm -hmm which was interesting. And it, John rides in and it fades to black for the second time. <laughs> and I was like, damn, is that going to be the end? But nope. Comes back with a cool montage of Starks getting dressed up oh, like, with the this. swords and braids and daggers and fancy clothing. And it reminded me of the montage at the start of episode of season six, episode 10, The Winds of Winter. Winds of Winter. <laughs> yeah. <gasps> All right, as Cersei yes. and Marjorie and Tommen are getting prepared mm -hmm. for the big day at the, of court, essentially, at the Sept of Baelor. And so we're, this is mim mimicked here, uh, mirrored here with the Stark family instead. And, Arya is preparing for her journey to sail west. Jon is clad in black again. Sansa is getting dressed up and entering the Winterfell throne room and walking amongst all the people. And Arya. Her dress. Oh, oh my god. My god. <laughs> so good. Yeah. It... With the with the weirwood leaves and the sleeves. Oh man, I'll have to go back and take a closer look because I didn't really oh, notice it's her. Her dress, the crown, the chair. The chair the, was really her... cool. Oh my god. The direwolves. Yeah on the sides and stuff and i saw her dress and i gasped nice i, like, I did too oh i really God. did i was like oh. i missed it oh. Um, oh it's beautiful it's so funny though that it, it shows all three of them walking through their people you know as sansa walks through the northern lords and Arya walks through her crew on her ship just like salty from the salt pans you know, <laughs> squab uh names you know that she used to go by when she's been on boats at various points in the show and uh, John is walking amongst the wildlings, and that's when he hears Ghost and looks over, and Ghost is big again, and they nuzzle each other, and Ghost is so huge, he kind of, like, knocks John off balance, which was funny. <laughs> like that. That was so cute. And finally, a good Ghost moment, and it cuts to, from the, the close-up of John and Ghost to the direwolf prow of Arya's ship, uh, which was a cool cut from direwolf to direwolf. And um, this is realizing that this is another season that ends with Arya sailing off into the horizon, which is kind of cool. And uh, they, oh, yeah, you know, like the end of yeah. season four. Yeah, you're right. I didn't even think about that. Sorry. The Children, <laughs> I think the episode was called. Mm hmm. And uh, so the net cuts to the gate opening at Castle Black again for John and Tormund to head north beyond the wall, which evokes that pilot episode scene and then it cuts back to Sansa who's being crowned and sits mm. in her direwolf throne and she gets the queen in the north chant the queen they're all in the north. fist pumping like, their swords oh, to the sky again. <laughs> the queen in the north so awesome love it and then we see that crown was like everything to me <laughs> I, I loved it it looks so good on her so cool yeah it's pretty cool for sure and the two direwolves howling yeah, yeah. and uh, then it cuts to Arya's ship and zooms outwards and revealing the massive direwolf sail which just looks looks beautiful and so good to see the direwolf sigil in any circumstance after being deprived of it for so long you know 
and then um, it cuts to John, lead, ghost leading the way, and John heading up north beyond the wall, followed behind by Tormund and a whole host of wildlings. And this is super significant. Like you mentioned, there was a patch of green grass. It could be hinting that beyond the wall, there may be, you know, some summer weather. Maybe it'll be green up there for, to, for some, to some extent. And now that the, like, this is a huge accomplishment, you know? I mean, Sansa is with her people, the, the Northern Lords that respect her and love her. And John is now beyond the wall with people who respect and love him. The people He's got that, the real North in him. Yeah, he has the real North in him. He helped free these people and helped get them past the wall so that they could be saved from the joining the army of the dead with the Night King. And these are people that who, whose respect he has earned you know he paid the, the iron price you could say for for this he doesn't need a last name for them yeah he doesn't need a last no. name for them he doesn't need anything for them because they follow strength they followed mance raider you know and just because of his strength of character it's sort of like the dothraki in that way you know what i mean so as as this monumental achievement has been undertaken and accomplished and the night king is gone and the the north beyond the wall is freed at least for now, from the grips of the undead abominations. <laughs> um, it's like a whole new area of the realm now is like safe to occupy. You know what I mean? So it's like- or like a new realm. His yeah, it's like a whole new realm. And I mean, if- Situation it, out there that he's going to create yeah. and lead. And yeah, if they're going to want anybody leading them, it, it would be Jon Snow or Aegon Targaryen, I guess. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's against the Night's Watch oath to to leave your post and everything like that but one we don't know if he even swore the oath again once he's beyond the wall and like from bran from being expelled from bran's jurisdiction in order for the king to try to get justice if john escaped the night's watch or refused to swear the oath he'd have to go through the northern kingdom which is a separate kingdom and he'd have to cross into beyond the wall which will probably be a new kingdom by that point um with true but i mean it, it would be sort of dishonorable for john not to swear the oath but then again i could see since he's already gave his life for the he's night's watch the, he's already oath. passed that whole point I right think. exactly they could they could just tell him like listen you've already done this we and i just don't recognize... think bran or sansa would pursue him if he were just to go beyond the wall and stay there yeah i don't think so either mm -hmm. i mean they're related and they were sad that they had to do it anyways. Yeah, totally. You know? It was more of like a scheme to get him to safety. And I feel like maybe... I was going to say it's like... A... Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. You, you go ahead. I was going to say it's kind of a quiet oath, quiet secret, quiet thing that they all kind of looked at each other and said, hey, you're in the Night's Watch. <laughs> yeah, you're... Yeah. I feel like maybe this was even part of Bran's plan that he, you know, saw all this happening that now the, the, the Westeros is divided into three pieces that are all ruled by Starks, potentially. <laughs> Bran Stark in the southern six kingdoms, Sansa Stark, queen in the north, and Jon yeah. Snow or Aegon Targaryen, who's basically a Stark in all but name. Yeah. As maybe the new king beyond the wall. I feel like if if they I think uh, that's what it is. You know? I think the Starks won the game. Yeah, like the Starks and and now we have Arya going west to to begin their expansion, you know, start colonizing a new continent. <laughs> the the Starks won the game for sure. It's so funny. So now full spectrum domination from south to north by the Starks on the continent of Westeros and Arya going west even further to to expand their sphere of influence, which is hilarious. I love it. I wrote I wrote it down that going beyond the wall was kind of almost in a way like John's retirement because he never liked being Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. He didn't like killing people and having all that political bullshit to deal with. Mm -hmm. And now that he's beyond the wall, I felt like he's home in a weird way. Yeah, de like, exactly. Totally. He has his, he has his dire wolf. He has one of his best friends, Tormund. Tormund. He knows the wildlings. He knows their culture. He knows what type of people they are and he can live Let's, you know, and I'm speculating here, of course, but 
maybe he could live the life that he wants to live moving forward yeah, because I think he, he could. doesn't have these responsibilities. It's entirely him possible. Down. Yeah, totally. So I took it as a almost like a sad positive. Like he does get banished and expelled from the, you know, like six, seven kingdoms. <laughs> but it opens but up a whole new world of possibility for him. Of of maybe peace for him. Yeah, like like uh, inner, inner, inner where they peace. began. Like the first thing he wanted to do was go be in the night's watch. Yep. And he ended where he began. He already took the oath and he <laughs> Yeah, that's so funny. Figured it out. I want to join the Night's Watch with you, Uncle Benjamin. And <laughs> you know and um it's yeah, it's crazy, man. So the gate starts lowering and John looks back as the gate co- covers him from view and then he turns back forward towards the front of the group of wildlings that's all heading north and cracks just a tiny smile and starts riding forward and it's like things are working out all right you know and we get like john just looks content in that moment and that's it from there it shows just it's just them riding out into the woods just like at the beginning of the pilot episode and Mm -hmm. cuts to black so I good. That. I thought so it was much. perfect. So good. I really did. Really, really great. I loved it. Yeah. I'm nice. so happy uh, that they pulled it together in the way that they did. I thought this was really great. All right. So moving on to my number one. You guys already did yours? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So moving on to my number one, which is the perpetual hand. <laughs> Tyrion, who just like can't get out of the game either. Like John, they keep dragging him back in. They pull him back in, you know, and <laughs> he just keeps being <laughs> made a hand of the king and hand of the queen <laughs> and things around him keep falling apart and he keeps trying to, <laughs> now he's just wants nothing to do with it, but he can't escape, you know, it's so funny. So uh, it's like John too. John's like, I don't want this. Tyrion's like, I don't want this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Bran's funny. like, I don't want this. <laughs> Bran's like, yeah. <laughs> or did I? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe who did he? Hmm. <laughs> I saw somebody posting that it, like Bran is the most evil character of all because he knew he was gonna gonna end up king apparently, and he just sat by and let millions of people be slaughtered without warning anybody or letting anybody know that it was gonna happen. Also, that he could end up on the throne. <laughs> I was like, damn. I was gonna ask you about that actually <laughs> it's so hardcore oh man it's funny maybe we'll talk about that later yeah. i was kind of curious about that <laughs> yeah we'll get there in a couple minutes when we get to brand's yeah, election yep. coming up so the scene starts with Tyrion, who's lying on the ground imprisoned um still as usual again you know what whichever adjective you want to pick for, <laughs> for Tyrion and being jailed and i was sure when gray worm arrives here and leads him out I thought he was walking to his execution. I thought they, Me too. you know, Me Danny. Too. Yeah. Yeah. I thought they found out Except, Danny was dead and that they were just going to fucking off him and be done with it, you know? Except, Except that you noticed was, oh. that his beard was longer. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Oh. He turned to me. He goes, check his beard. He I goes, it's that. been some time. His beard is longer. I noticed John's was longer. <laughs> but yeah. No, I noticed Tyrion's was. And that's the only thing that, like, the first thing I thought was, oh, he's about to die. And then I was like, wait. Yeah. He right, just said just like that she doesn't keep prisoners for very long. Yeah. Oh, good point. Yeah. And, and then his long ass beard. Because he was dead. Dude, she was dead. <laughs> that's so crazy. I also have to give a shout out to Dave. I don't know if I mentioned this last night, but he called Bran sitting on the Iron Throne at the beginning of the season. Oh, really? Did he really? And I totally like shut him down. I was like, there's no way. The wheelchair was the giveaway, I guess, right? Yeah. They he goes, I just have this feeling. Like, what's his purpose? Chair. Yeah, that's so crazy. Good for so, you, Dave. Yeah. You nailed that Dave. one, buddy. Well <laughs> That's awesome. Well yeah. played. <laughs> well played, good well friend. Well played, good sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I started thinking, what the hell is going on when, when I saw Sansa and Bran at the gathering? I was like, what the fuck is going on here? Oh, time must have passed, you know? <laughs> and um, immediately Sansa's. Like, and they don't do that very often. Like, yeah. they do it where you don't, they don't talk about it. They don't make it obvious. Mm-hmm. But they don't. I know that I noticed on the show they don't do voiceovers. I think they've done it maybe twice. I think what, uh, 
Didn't they do that like with Tyrion? They did a whole voiceover with Tyrion. They did, and then they did one with John too. Yeah, uh, uh, during the Battle of Winterfell. Yeah, a, and then they don't. Voiceover? They don't do well. Like if if there's a voiceover, they're taking audio of a, another conversation or monologue that's occurring, and they'll play a montage of clips under it, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because we'd never get like narration per se. No. Um. Yeah, it's something that they don't do often. We get it when Littlefinger's conversation about the ladder with a montage over Sansa crying as his ship goes away. We get oh, okay, I see what you're we saying. get um John having a montage uh, or speaking about strategy a couple weeks ago over a montage. They do do it occasionally. Right. But it's not very often. They don't they very rarely do it and if they do it, it's important. Yeah, like, definitely. Very important. And they they don't do like five years later or anything. Right, yeah. <laughs> so this was kind of like, whoa, 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 well, whoa. Some time has passed. <laughs> what happened? So they get out there and we see Yara Greyjoy. We see the new Prince of Dorne. We see Robin Aaron, who looks like he's grown up 10 years, which he has, <laughs> which is so crazy. He's super tall now. Yeah, I saw somebody posted a great meme with... It's like the key, because people were saying, what, like, oh, Robin Aaron's hot now. And... uh they, like the actor or whatever so they were like the key to growing up strong is milk you know and it was like a picture of Tormund you know with Tormund like milk all over him <laughs> and Robin Heron is like breast milk until he, he was like 10 good, though. Like, he does look good though he does look good he turned into a pretty <laughs> handsome young man yeah good oh. for him Good for him. Who are the other two people sitting there? There's one guy like good, next yeah, to Royce question. and then there's one guy next to Sam yeah mm-hmm. not sure any ideas Sarah? Uh, no, I was going to ask the same question because um, I was trying to think who they would be related to, why they would be related to, you know, that position and throne. I don't know. It's possible one of them could be Howland Reed, um, oh. just because that oh, yeah, that's still I a surviving about, great house. If that's Howland Reed, people were mad about that. I don't know. Well, there ended up being no reason for Howland Reed, so it would have right. made sense, and it might make sense in the books when there's more time and Danny might need more proof. But we kind of had to just, you know, Danny. Danny just kind of had to believe Bran and, and Sam at this point because there just wasn't enough time to flesh everything out, yeah. you know. Um, agreed. So of course, immediately Sansa's like, "Where's John?" You know, and we learn that Grey Worm and the Unsullied and the Dothraki basically are, are occupying King's Landing. And that John and Tyrion are their prisoners, and they will decide what they do with their prisoners, because it's their city now. And Sansa's like, well, if you look outside the gates, there's thousands of Northmen who will explain to you why harming Jon Snow is not in your interest. And uh, they're going back and forth about all this, and we learn that, you know, Yara Greyjoy's there, and she's like, some of you are quick to forgive, but the Ironborn are not. I swore to follow Daenerys Targaryen. And I, I thought it was interesting that she's like so gung ho, still backing Danny, but she didn't see what Danny did, you know. Exactly. And she yeah. also she didn't yeah. see that. Yeah, and she also was in love with Danny as well, just like John and Tyrion. You know, she basically offered her hand in marriage for or part she of the alliance deal. Most of them were seduced by her. Oh yeah, very totally. Easily. That's a good point. Good, good way to put it. I mean. Maybe she does just doesn't care that much because she's ironborn. All they do is rape and reeve and pillage and row, you know, like and that's true. So yeah. maybe it's just like didn't phase Yara. She's like, good for you, Danny. Like sack in the city. That's what we would have done, you know. So Sansa's all pissed. She's like, you swore to follow a tyrant, but Yara does point out that Danny freed them from Cersei, who was also a tyrant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then Jon Snow put a knife in her heart, and she's all pissed off about that. Let the Unsullied give him what he deserves. It's like, oh, man, I can see how people are mad about this, you know? And, but but uh, Arya is not having any of that. I love this. She uh, looks right over And it's over representing Yara. all of the fans, almost. It's representing every, like, every person who's like, but I think that this was silly and I hated that. I feel like it's going from every direction in that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's covering the full a spectrum of commentary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And so um, Arya is super pissed and she's like, say another word about killing my brother and I'll cut your throat. And Yara looks like she's about ready to go for a second there, uh, which is kind of funny. 
But then Davos steps up, friends, please, <laughs> and manages to calm everybody down. And everybody kind of sits back. And he does point out, we've been cutting each other's throats for long enough. Like, this has to end, you know? Like, we've been through years of bloodshed. And this, it's, like, ridiculous. Look at what's sitting in front of us, just a city that's destroyed. This could happen to the whole continent if we don't get our shit together. You know what I mean? And um, so he tries to be respectful to Grey Worm and address him properly. <laughs> Torgo Torgo Nudo. Nudo. <laughs> <laughs> Am I saying that Am properly? Saying that right? And it's so funny. It cuts to Grey Worm and he's just standing there. He's just like, no. <laughs> no. Torgo Nudo. Am I saying that properly? He doesn't move a milli inch anywhere in his body. Mm -hmm. He's just statue esque, you know, and it's just mm -hmm. hilarious. It's like it cuts to a still frame of Grey Worm, <laughs> and Tyrion even is like, <laughs> like, is he gonna react at all? Like, wow, he's yeah. standing really still. He's like Drax in in uh, what's it called? Uh, in Guardians Guard of the Galaxy. Yeah. I've mastered the ability of standing so incredibly still that I've become invisible to the eye. Watch. You didn't even see me move. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's how still Torgo Nudo was at that point, which is hilarious. And he Davos is trying to, you know, get them on the team. And he's like, listen, you guys did so much to help us. We owe you a debt that can never be repaid. We totally recognize that. And we, we want to, you know, do something to, to help you know, to try at least to repay it. And Sansa's like, yeah, nodding. And he mentions land in the reach. There's land in the reach. Good land. The people that used to live there are gone. Make it your own. And I'm like, no, that's bronze land. That's, that's right? high garden you're talking about. And uh, no, although, see, uh, I thought the same thing. I guess there's also the Tarleys, you know, but then again, the Mrs. Tarley is still there, you know, Sam's mom and everything. Horn Hill. Yeah, yeah Horn Hill. Mm -hmm. So I think he's, she and his daughter are still there. Yeah, and they wouldn't displace them. So they've got to be talking about a high garden, right? And I if, took it as high think. garden. Yeah, so if Davos had given them high garden and then Tyrion, Tyrion had ended up free, he would have had to watch his back for Bronn because <laughs> Bronn <laughs> wouldn't have been able to get high garden and then he would have come for Tyrion, you know? So luckily that didn't happen because Tyrion would have had another death death warrant on his head. <laughs> so uh, Grey Worm's like, no, we do not need payment. We need justice. Jon Snow cannot go free. And Tyrion steps, like speaks out here. Surprisingly, he's just like, dude, like it's not up to you, man. Who died and made you king? Uh, well, it's like, uh, Danny, you know? <laughs> I know, that's why I said well, that. that's what I was yeah, going to exactly. say. Like, like, so what do you think happened right after Danny died? Like, how do you think everything played out that made him think, okay, we'll just take over? I guarantee you, Drogon screamed and wailed and howled and went flying off. And people saw this and heard it from miles away. And I, I bet you anything that the Unsullied were like, as soon as they heard that shit, started Straight. rushing the rushing the keep. And they probably came into the throne room and found John sit standing there like, oh, you know, <laughs> and uh. probably asked him what <laughs> happened. And he probably told them exactly what happened. And they were like, uh, you're being taken into custody. I think they've do it, been doing a lot of cleanup, too. <laughs> oh, think. like cleaning up the city? Yeah, I think, yeah. you know, like they control the city, but there's a, like a lot of stuff to do before they talk about, you know, conquering something else. That city is just decimated. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Totally destroyed. Totally destroyed. And Grey Worm is pissed. He's like, you are not allowed to speak right now. <laughs> yeah, like, what the hell? You're our prisoner. Shut the hell up. We didn't bring you here to talk. <laughs> So funny. Yeah, Everyone's from his heard perspective, enough. he has every right to be pissed. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you look at it from his point of view, yeah, I would be pissed too. I've done everything for this one person and he just got killed. <laughs> like, right. And we don't know why. By your friend, you, who you told to kill him or her. Uh, yep. <laughs> so, um, 
he, he was like, everyone has heard enough words from you. And I thought this was funny because Tyrion is known as just a talker, you know? <laughs> he talks and talks and talks. Like there's that scene in Marine where he's trying to get him, Grey Worm and Missandei, to talk and just like joke or like be human a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so he's like, God damn it. Like everyone's heard enough from you, Tyrion. Like just shut your mouth for once. And no one is any better for it. Yeah, Tyrion even admits it straight up. But it's not for you to decide. You know, his fate is for our king to decide or our queen. And everyone's like, what the fuck are you talking about? We don't have one. And he's like, <laughs> kind of points out, uh, here we are. You know, you guys, we're the most powerful people in Westeros all sitting right here. Like, pick one, you know? Figure it out. And Let's even, make a choice. Yeah, and Grey Worm thinks about it. And he's like, yeah, you know, that does make sense. Just make your choice then and kind of stands down. And I was like, <laughs> Dude, even Grey Worm is down. That's pretty funny. Mm. Um, and then Q... Edmure fucking oh Tully. The floppy fish. What a loser. He thinks he's a good candidate, which is great. He goes, mm, my lords and ladies. You're the idiot out of <laughs> yeah. all of them. I love the way they played that out, though. Like, it, it made it, they gave him bravasso. Like, he was just like, I have my speech and I'm so ready. Oh, he's like, yeah, oh, like bravado, it. you mean? Bravado, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> like, he was ready to go. He had a speech. Like, he was ready to do the whole thing. Uncle. What we decide today will reverberate <laughs> through the annals of history. <laughs> you know, I stand before you as a senior lo- one of the senior lords in the country, a veteran of two wars, and I'd like, like he to really thought Mike's. it was going to happen. For yeah, him. <laughs> like he's so funny. The way he's he says there all is, proud. I'd like to think my experience has led to <clears throat> some small skill in statecraft and understand <laughs> like it's like dude you've been imprisoned for the past number of years after failing Sounds at like everything that you were told to do down yeah <laughs> uncle please sit so politely like, uncle. damn <laughs> it, i mean it was kind of rude it was polite but rude at the same time and then he like looks around and everyone's just like oh my god <laughs> Yeah, and he looks around, everybody's like, mm, like rubbing their beards and stuff. And he goes to turn and smacks his sword against the, like a pole, which makes him just <laughs> illustrates Awkward. and demonstrates how inept he is, you know, just like just total lack of awareness of his surroundings mm. and, you know, stuff like that. Like um, in Batman Begins. You haven't beaten me. You have sacrificed sure footing for a killing stroke. He just has no idea of what's going on around him. So uh, Tyrion <laughs> speaks up again, and he's like, well, we have to choose someone. And this is where Sam has the hilarious meta commentary moment, because so many people were like, maybe they'll make a, like a representative democracy where everybody votes, you know? And this is the showrunners basically laughing at us, like, no, oh, we're not going to give you that. <laughs> yeah. That would be too good, you know? Sam was so great in that, and everyone just starts busting up laughing at yeah, him. Yeah, <laughs> maybe the decision about what's best for everyone should be, well... Left to everyone. <laughs> I love that they like he pu- he put together a whole point, and they gave him all that time to put together that point. Yeah, and laid it out very and eloquently. The comedic timing was like boom. No, nope. <laughs> Maybe we should give the dogs a vote as well. <laughs> I'll ask my horse. <laughs> I'll ask my horse. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, Edmure speaks up again to Tyrion, and he you know says what a few people are probably thinking. Like, I bet you want the crown, huh? To Tyrion. And, and Tyrion, he's like, no. Yeah, he's <laughs> everybody hates me for one reason or another. <laughs> yeah, it shows that he is the one with like the small skill in statecraft and diplomacy. Like he can see what the people would be thinking. The imp, the half man, mm-hmm. the twisted monkey demon that everybody remembers and hates, who killed their king and was in exile and then came back wor- working for the enemy with the dragon who roasted the city and killed everybody mm-hmm. that he didn't manage to kill this first round when he was working for like, under Joffrey, <laughs> you know. Uh, and and yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, people would hate him, you know, <laughs> half the people hate him, half the people, you know, hate him for he's kind of himself. Like, yeah, he, he's yeah, he thinks he's worthless. And that's the, like the saddest part about him. He's lost faith in himself as we mm-hmm. as we learn, you know. So uh, it's like I can't think of a worse choice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so somebody's like, well, who then? And 
he's, it's very interesting his response. He's he, he's a thinker. He always has been, and it's amazing to me also that everybody's looking to him for answers. And he's being extracted from a jail cell, and after everything that he's been through and done, and the way that people see him, like he mentions. But these these lords and ladies don't they know him to some extent? They don't see him as a monster because they know him. So all these people are looking to him for advice, which is just kind of wild. Um, and he's standing there in shackles and he's <laughs> laying out the new system, essentially, you know? He basically just, just decides everything. <laughs> uh, I love that they said, like, you're, or, um, Grey Worm, don't talk. You don't get to talk. You don't, And he just talks. Yeah, <laughs> and Grey Worm just backs off and lets him, too. Uh, so he's like, I've had nothing to do but think these past few weeks about our bloody history, about the mistakes we've made. And this is a crazy point. You know, it reminds people, it's remindful of that riddle of where power lies. You know, is it, does it lie with the king? Does it lie with the clergy? Does it lie with the coin? Does it lie with the swords? You know? And so he's like, what, what unites people? Armies, gold, flags, stories. There's nothing in the world more important powerful than a good story nothing can stop it nothing no enemy can defeat it and it reminded me of that idea from v for vendetta what is it ideas are bulletproof yes you know yep. which was really cool ideas are bulletproof. but this is the saddest part of the entire episode for me it's like this was supposed to be a moment about how the show brought people together and gave them something to enjoy. And instead, in, instead of being interpreted and received that way, for me, this moment sort of lost its weight because of like the way that the fan base has reacted to this season, in my opinion. <sighs> okay, so um, back to the idea of a story being something nobody can defeat. Nothing can stop it. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was interesting. Just the idea of a story, you know, if you're going to elect a leader, somebody with a cool story, that's not qualification for a position of leadership. You know what I mean? Like, if I'm going to look for a leader, I'm looking for somebody who has philosophies and policies that I agree with, that I find that I find just. You know what I mean? So to just say, uh, <laughs> who has an interesting story? The brand the broken. You know, at its but face, this is Westeros. It, what? It's a lot. I said it's Westeros, though. It's a lot different. Right. But at, whole... at its face, it doesn't seem to make sense. But the way that he fleshes it out, it does end up sort of making sense because it's not just about the story. He does have a fascinating story, which makes him interesting and makes mm-hmm. him, you know, like something that people could think about and be willing to want to, you know, have as their leader. But uh, what is important about Bran is is not necessarily the story of how he became the Three-Eyed Raven, but the fact that he is the Three-Eyed Raven. He's our memory, the keeper of our stories, the wars, weddings, births, massacres, famines, our triumphs, our defeats, our past. Who better to lead us into the future? So it goes from being about the story to being being about the knowledge. And even even that in itself isn't the best, you know, because like, yeah, he may know all the stories and uh, all the details, but what if he sides with the leadership style of Magor the Cruel? <laughs> you know what I mean? Over, over like, net, you know, like some other just king, like Jaehaerys the Conciliator. You know what I mean? We don't know. Yeah. Just because he knows everything doesn't mean he'll pick the side that, that we find to be just. Although I think they're implying that he sort of has a just nature. They're trying to give you knowledge is power, that yeah. whole thing. Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, so it's kind of funny. The whole time Tyrion is pumping up Bran here and telling about his amazing story, going beyond the wall after being crippled and you know never being able to walk again, but learning to fly and a crippled boy surviving beyond the wall and Sam is like, oh, like, and all these people are like, oh, this is pretty amazing, you know? <laughs> and I bet some of them are like, what the fuck's the Three-Eyed Raven? What does that even mean? What are you talking about? He knows about all the weddings and wars and, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, the whole time that he's going through this, this rant, pushing for Bran, Sansa and Arya are like, huh? <laughs> kind of looking back and forth at each other, like, what is he talking about? I think Sansa might have been a little hurt here that Tyrion didn't nominate her. Yeah, totally. After everything that she's yeah. been through and the fact that she wants it 
and Bran doesn't. I yeah. think the look on her face to oh, Tyrion was like, what the fuck? That, lo- that like, look of entitlement that she, she, she And I think that's so funny because it. she even says, like, Bran doesn't have any interest in ruling and he can't father children. Like, how the fuck do I you know that? I'm perfect fit for this. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. She's definitely prompt, like um, p- positioning herself, to, <laughs> like you said, for sure. That was the way I read it, too, that she was like, oh, this should be me, you know, which is kind yeah. of funny. But, but even Arya's like, huh, too? Because, you know, from Sansa's perspective, it should be me. And from Arya's perspective, who has the most interesting story? She might. <laughs> you know, she's got a really interesting, you know, she's learned to, like, transcend the laws of physics as well and, you know, learned to, um, to, transform and morph to t- different shape-shifting abilities and crazy skills and stuff like that and so she's got a pretty interesting story too you know she's got a good case if it was just about the story but uh bran you know has a good important knowledge base knowing the past uh, will help you to build a better future by being able to pick out the things that worked and benefited the most people and employ them and improve them. And uh, so Bran could be theoretically a good choice as long as he has uh, that good Stark morality, which he probably does because he's a Stark, you know? And I love but Tyrion. judging everything that just happened, did he use good Stark morality if he knew everything that just happened before? Uh, that's, the, that's the question, yeah. Is if he... Yeah, if he knew this was all going to happen and allowed a million people to be slaughtered just so that he could end up on the throne. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, who knows? I mean, that's why I love the show, though. Right. We can talk about it for days. <laughs> yeah. And there's also the question of like, huh, like how much of Bran Stark really is left at all? Like, is is this like that's a great question. Is this like a large portion of like the three eyed raven? You know, like, is it? Like this figure who's been trapped under a tree and has been looking for the perfect pawn to take over to rule the Seven Kingdoms. Like, is it even Bran Stark anymore? Did he allow all these millions of people to be slaughtered? This million people to be slaughtered because his autonomy was overridden by the third, the Three Eye Raven entity, whoever this is. This like he has said, uh, like we should go back and count how many times he has said, "I'm, I'm not, not Bran Brandon anymore. Stark. I'm yeah. not Bran anymore." I remember what it's like to be him, but he may be like somebody else entirely like he may be the god like like the the tr- like the, the the one of the old gods or something you know what i mean like mm-hmm. the three-eyed raven could be like this transcendent figure this combination of all these entities combined into one like i don't know like it, we don't know if its intent so is good. good or bad or what you know <laughs> it's just interesting who knows maybe it's bran maybe it's not but uh what do you think <laughs> yeah, yeah let us know right to ravens at game of microphones.com <laughs> so so um oh yeah so so sansa's like like you said bran has no interest in ruling and he can't even father children and bran kind of looks over like what you think you can speak for me you know <laughs> like, mm-hmm. he kind of eyes her and Batyrian's like good Sons of kings can be cruel and stupid, as you well know. You know, his will never torment us. And uh, looks back at Grey Worm, like trying to earn a little bit of, you know, respect and confidence back from him and points out, you know, this is the wheel our queen wanted to break. And he even calls Danny our queen still, uh, which is interesting. So he this he's just like dictates here what's what it's gonna be. Like this is not a question, this is a statement. He says, From now on, rulers will not be born. They will be chosen on this spot by the lords and ladies of Westeros to serve the realm. And he just like dictates that that's the way it's going to be now, you know? And I was just like, epic. Like that is the breaking the wheel. That's, you know, instead of having a hereditary monarchy, having some form of uh, elected leadership is, it's definitely the first step, you know? So, uh, so he turns to Bran and he's like, I know you don't want it. I know you don't care about power. But if I ask you, if we choose you, will you wear the crown? Will you lead the seven kingdoms to the best of your abilities from this day until your last day? And it sort of reminded me of like the mar- like a marriage vow, like or, until you, death do you part, you know, like, will you take this seriously and like be, be real or you know, like the oath of office or something. But, um, and he's like, you said, why do I, why do you think I came all this way? And he sort of smiles, and I was like, "What?" Robo Brand smiles. Creepy Brand. Creepy okay, Brand. 
dude. He's the ultimate creep er man. I thought that was a, a weighted line. I came all this way because of Bran's journey. Like, right. he was he went beyond the wall. He became the Three Eyed Raven, meaning like Bran came all this way to be to be in a the place, new king, the new king called Bran the Broken, which I mentioned a little bit earlier that that symbolized to me the broken the wheel. breaking of the wheel. Yep. So yeah. I mean, he came all this way. Yeah, he came down from Winterfell, but I think there was more weight behind that statement than just mm -hmm. right. Well, yeah, I mean, I traveled three weeks to get here. That's why I came all this way. I've seen it's all like, these complaints about this. It's like, well, what connection did to the Night King does Arya even have? Why does it make sense for her to kill him? I'm like, well, maybe because the Night King is the greatest enemy of the many faced God who's literally undoing his work by resurrecting the thousands and thousands of dead people that's like the whole purpose of the many faced god is to deliver death to give the gift and like this dude's undoing his work so he sends his you know one of his great assassins Arya, to be in the right place at the right time because she's a stark and it makes perfect sense to eliminate the night king on behalf of the many faced god or then they're like well Thank what's you. what was the purpose of bran's whole story at all and it's like obviously like Tyrion just said to become the new king to rule justly <laughs> to know all the past know history to prevent it from repeating itself and it's like he's the if you know if they say history repeats itself the ultimate way to break the wheel to stop the wheel from going in the cycle and repeating itself is to have the person who knows history the best be the ruler who's bran who can stop the cycle by knowing mm -hmm. history to prevent it from repeating itself you know what i mean so it makes sense, basically, is what I'm <laughs> what I'm getting at here. Like, <laughs> well done, hey. Yeah, these critical <laughs> these criticisms that people have, like they don't stand up to my scrutiny. Well, and at people least people are welcome to have criticisms, but it gets so it gets so extra that it's yeah, kind super of, extra. And like think about it. Just think about the story. Think about the characters. Right. Think about these people who we've learned about the last decade. It's there. Everything is there. Yeah, and, and like I understand how people are feel hurt like they feel like legitimately like hurt and are lashing out but before you make your final decision go back and rewatch the series and pay attention exactly. to all the little details and listen to our rewatch mm -hmm. you know because we'll yeah. break it all down and if you like agree with what we've said the whole time maybe you'll agree with and it, you'll end up agreeing with us liking the ending you know because <laughs> we've been pointing out all the details and and if not then we'll talk about it <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> so he's like why do you think i came all this way and smiles and Tyrion. it is typical like he's always this type of character like of course he's going to be his hand he's already serving as the hand of the kingdom right the kingdoms right now just by provoking this conversation and leading the the, 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 the mm. discussion in this direction and laying out the plan he is the hand already de facto you know what i mean so to Brendan of House Stark, I say I, and he would be toasting if he had a drink, but instead he's in shackles. I think he like raises him up a little bit. Yeah. And uh, Samwell enthusiastically agrees, I, you know, <laughs> like looks at, at Tyrion and smiles and shakes his head one by like one. <laughs> yeah, everybody on Sam's side first says I. It's like Sam and whoever's sitting next to him, I can't remember. I think they kind of go like in a little circle there. It's mm -hmm. all... Yeah, it's it's everybody on his side. Then it's like the Dornish guy and and um, I love Davos. He's like, I'm not sure I get a vote. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's awesome, man. You gotta love Davos. It was so good. And even Maybe Robin so. Aaron too was hilarious. The the uh, Lord Royce was like, mm, I and like looks over at Robin like you should probably agree too, and he's just kind of like, mm, like whatever, <laughs> like blase, like limp wrist, like I think literally like. Like yeah. limp wrists over to the side, like whatever, you know, sure. And then it gets to Sansa, and yeah. it's like she's silent and she turns to Bran, and I loved it. She goes, I love you, little brother. I always will. You'll be a good king. But tens of thousands of North men fell in the Great War defending all of Westeros, and those who have survived had seen too much and fought too hard to ever kneel again. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, I, I did love Sansa here. I yeah. know we ripped on her a little bit this season, but this she has stuck moment. true to her word. She is, you know, representing her people as she should as the, you know, wardeness of the North at this point. Mm -hmm. And so she declares, she doesn't even ask. She's mm -hmm. like, the North is going to remain an independent king kingdom. As it was and, for thousands of and, years. 
brands like I can't disagree with you. Uh, it was funny because <laughs> mm-hmm. she's you know she says the North will remain an independent kingdom as it has for thousands of years as it was for thousands of years and it looks around the audience and people are like oh you know like that kind of makes sense like even Yara Greyjoy. <laughs> So I, for a second here, before Bran reacts, he kind of like blank face turns to, to her. I thought he was going to shut her down for a sec, just for a split second, but he nods. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. But um, like you said, this is a great moment for Sansa where she's standing up for her people and for what they believe in and not, not backing down on their cause, even when it would be her brother who would be ruling all seven of the kingdoms. She's like... You know, it's not going to fly, even though you're my brother and you'd have our interest at heart and you'd, you know, work for us as opposed to a Targaryen leader or somebody working against us. Like it's still it's not going to fly. The The North has to be its own kingdom. So that was pretty cool. Just knowing that Bran agreed and uh Tyrion does his whole herald thing here. All hail Bran the Broken, first of his name, king of the Andals and the first men, lord of the seven kingdoms and protector of the realm. And everybody stands up in unison. All hail Bran the Broken. It was just so epic, man. So, Sarah, I guess this is the reason that the three-eyed raven, you know, fought, did all this for Bran. I guess he knew that this was Bran's purpose, right? Or or maybe the Three-Eyed Raven hijacked Bran to claim the throne for himself. What do you think? Well, I think the Three-Eyed Raven knew or had visions of what the future would be, and then Bran had to make it happen. Yeah, he knew that, I think you're right. You know, yeah. I, I don't know, like one of those alternate universe kind of things, like it could either go this way or that way. And Bran had to do everything to make it happen that way, like his visions. And he knew it was coming, but he needed all the people in his game to make it happen the way he thought. I agree. I think that it is Bran, and that I think that, you know, he has been seen, he had been foreseen for a thousand years that the Three-Eyed Raven was just waiting for Bran for this moment in destiny Mm -hmm. when it would take a combination of Bran and Jon and the Starks and Arya and Sansa, these three, four critical people that Mm -hmm. were necessary to... Eliminate the Targaryen Starks. threat. It's yeah, all they're all Starks. Like, that was the I loved that, that it was all you. Starks. That was so cool. Even oh, yeah. even John, even though he's not a Stark, he's always he's been cool. kind of a Stark. Yeah. You know, so he he's potentially going to be like the king beyond the wall. Then you have Arya, who's like the king queen of the New World. And then you have Sansa's the queen in the North, and Bran is the king of the Six Kingdoms. Yeah, yep. so I cool. Loved it. Full spectrum domination for anybody who is worried around How season Stark. three or four. <laughs> yeah, like, oh my God, how Stark is gone. And then the banners <laughs> unfurl at Winterfell when they take it back. And now there's just Stark banners everywhere. North, yeah. beyond the wall, probably. The Southern Kingdoms sailing west. Like, Stark's really came through in the end. Just uh, Sansa's whole scene, her crown, everything about that. Oh, yeah. I'll yeah. say it again. was perfect. Yeah. Like, everything. Yeah, it Beautiful. really was. Uh, yeah, everything just ended so well. Like everything just makes so much sense and ties together so perfectly. Well, that's the thing. It makes sense. It makes mm-hmm. so much sense. Yeah. Like I don't think I could have written that better. Everyone thinks, oh, I would have done it this way. No, I, I yeah. think this is best. And they told us from the beginning it was going to be bittersweet. Yeah. You're not going to get what you want or what you don't want. It's going to be delivered. I'm mm-hmm. I'm convinced that a lot of people like are just aren't understanding some of this stuff. Like, yeah, just haven't like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. You know, um. So, uh, so this is when Bran drops the bomb on the perpetual hand t- Tyrion, who just can't can't go without being nominated Hand of the King. <laughs> you know, at every step of the journey, like first his father makes him a hand uh, in his stead. And then he, then he is not made hand for real and earns it by Danny, and then here again he is nominated it. <laughs> At this point, though, He's he like, doesn't Please want it. Choose Sir Davos. <laughs> yeah, the, the way he, that line, the way he said that, choose anyone else. You know, like it was yeah. so good. His performance here is is great. Again, he's so sincere and so like meek about it like uh, to some extent like he's like no he, your, your grace i don't want it <laughs> you know <laughs> oh, please don't yeah like, really really he's, dude it's like well i don't want to be king you know and he's like 
I don't deserve it. I thought I was wise, but I wasn't. I thought I knew it was right, but I didn't. Choose Sir Davos, <laughs> which is a good Please. suggestion. <laughs> choose anyone else. You know, choose, choose fucking Carl Tanner. I was a fucking legend, Ginelli. A fucking legend. <laughs> fucking Carl Tanner. And so uh, he's like, I, I choose you. You know, and Grey Worm's not having it. It's, but he's like, dude, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, were you not just paying attention? I'm your king now. You know, like, mm-hmm. but Grey Worm's like, this man is a criminal. He deserves justice. And this is such a poignant line. Just this makes me confident that Bran does understand the concept of justice and will be a good leader. Because he, 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 tell, he tells Grey Worm, you know, this is justice for Tyrion Lannister. Like, he's made many terrible mistakes, as mm-hmm. you know, you know, but he's going to spend the rest of his life fixing them. Fixing when it. all he wants to do is just go, go and relax. And it's like... And drink and make make his vineyard and mm-hmm. serve serve the imp's delight. The imp's delight. Oh my God! I bet that's going to happen now. I bet really that will happen now that he is in a position where he's not like like nobody's hunting him <laughs> at this moment in time. You know. <laughs> yeah. I bet the imp's delight will be served in just a few short years. At least eight. At least eight. It it's... takes about eight years for a vineyard to develop grapes good enough for making wine eight to ten years nice yeah there you go so eight to ten years we can expect the imps to light uh (laughs) ask me again in 10 years (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) yeah definitely so i thought this was a damn good argument by bran you know Tyrion, his penance will be fixing the the mistakes that you know the damage that's been caused by the mistakes that he made by backing danny and you know failing to see things you know see things as clear as he could have so this was great i thought this was really good i was skeptical of the brand idea because we don't know what he'd be like policy wise but you know this this makes me feel a little confident he'll be able to know history and prevent it from repeating itself and uh, he seems to have that's the key yeah Mm -hmm. and and he also just seems to have an innate sense of justice which seems to be common for the starks he's objective too because he's unemotional and Mm -hmm. He's not like because, as uh, Princess Sarah said, you know, he's stated so many times that he's not Brandon Stark, that mm-hmm. he's not Lord of Winterfell. Yeah, he's very objective. He he doesn't have an allegiance, you know, That's other a good point than as well. Very good. Point. Who he was born as, but he's not that person anymore. So he doesn't have an allegiance to one specific house over the other, and I think he'll be. A just ruler. He's a perfect ruler in that sense. That yeah, yeah. and he has a good team of people supporting him, and then he also is able, like you said, Duncan, to to kind of like go back into the history in his mind and see, like, you know, did a similar decision like this. What what was the outcome of that? Right. Let's say we do different. Yeah. Let's say the Ironborn or somebody starts to rebel against the Seven Kingdoms. He can review all of the ways that this has been handled in the past and come to, you know, find like potentially a diplomatic solution or you know Mm -hmm. whatever may work best. He can review examples. which is pretty cool. So the the scene, it. yeah, me too. So he's going to spend the rest of his life fixing fixing these mistakes. And uh, Grey Worm says it is not enough. Which um, then it cuts to the other final decision, which is uh, you know what's going to happen with Jon Snow. But this wraps up my uh, my number one, the perpetual nice. hand, Tyrion, who just can't escape serving justice and serving his <laughs> kingdoms. That was a nice. great number one. Hello. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, should we move nice. on to notes? Notes, yes. But first, season four of Sirenicide, featuring me and Archmaester Stitches, gets closer every day. So let's take a quick break to check out the series trailer. My name is Matthew Finnis, and something terrible has happened to me. An event that has sent me traveling down a road I was never meant to be on. This is my story and the story of countless others. This is a story of what lies in the shadows of Morstan, Texas. 
Siren Aside is a serialized horror drama based in the wicked world woven in and around Morston, Texas. The criminal factions and dark government agencies are just the start of the malevolence that roams the streets of this macabre city. The tales in Siren Aside tap into the fear and lore that envelop what most would consider to be fiction. How much more is out there? Is every monster real? Hmm, most tales are based on some fact. The production plays host to a plethora of popular personalities from other nightmarish podcasts. Oh, it's Lena. Lena Klein. Just a number now. That's it. Four, four, seven. I bet you believe in yellow eyes now, huh, boy? Thanks to the research team here at the Laughlin Institute, we have finally found the answer to beating disease entirely. What have I done? <laughs> Kate, Kate, help me, please. <laughs> That's not me. His body is accepting death. Evil has reigned unchecked in this city for far too long. The main cast of Sirenicide's creepy, courageous, and curious characters evolve with the overarching story, but they also chronicle some amazing self-contained standalone tales. It's vile. Eddie, vile. Reporting live, I'm Margaret Sharp. Back to you, Dave. An operating theater. Well, more of a stage to showcase our talents to our clients. Look at me, please. We'll climb this mountain together. The original music serves the episode's atmosphere in a way that embraces and enhances each scene. So uncover the dark secrets, evil murders, supernatural experiences, and mysterious doctors awaiting in this modern epic. Binge the show for free right now on your favorite podcast platform or at sirenicide.com. We talked about the Grey Worm executing the Lannister soldiers. Um, we did not talk about that yet. No, okay. we didn't go into detail about okay. that. Yeah, that's my first note. So we get John kind of walking through the destruction, and we see all the dead bodies and the burned bodies, and we come across the Unsullied, and they have, I, would, I want to say like six or seven Lannister soldiers on their knees ready to execute them dude this reminded me of the opening scene of the video game last of us where you're going through oh, really? yeah you're walking through the dystopic um like um like um uh, tyrannical version of boston after an outbreak of cordyceps creates zombies and it's like under martial law basically and oh, shit. you're walking through the area and these troops have like a people lined up along the edge of the street like that and they're just executing people and it was like oh man totally this just like really made me think of it you know it's really powerful and so we hear Grey Worm in the name of the one true queen Daenerys Targaryen I sentence you to die and then we hear John like John doesn't yell too often I mean he's no. yelled before but like in, during battle and stuff, but Twice he hardly this ever raises his voice other than being in battle. And he's like, Grey Worm. And everyone like turns to look at him. He's like, it's fucking over. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Yeah. These guys are prisoners. They gave up, dude. Yeah. It, they fucking rung the bells too. I mean, like, and we're still slaughtering people. Yeah, and it's Grey Worm who says, these men are prisoners. It's not. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 
It's not over until the queen's names. enemies are defeated. Well, and then he's like, "What? What are you? What are you considering defeated?" Yeah, they're on their knees already. You know, <laughs> they're yeah. breathing. Yeah, like, oh, like, oh, shit. The that fuck? was hard. And Davos, you know, steps up again with his friend rhetoric, trying to calm everybody down. <laughs> Look around, you friend. We won. <laughs> I obey my queen's commands, not yours. Says Grey Worm and. John's like, well, what the fuck are the Queen's commands? Like, God damn it, dude. And he's and kill all who follow Cersei Lannister. These are free men. They chose to fight for her. And Grey Worm goes to pull his dagger out. And oh man, dude, John grabs his arm as he moves forward. And instantly all the unsullied spears drop and point down towards the Northmen. And the Northmen draw their blades in terror. And they're like, oh, you know, like, like looking around. And John's Thomas, like, easy, like, easy. easy. <laughs> Dude. And Grey Worm and John are just like grilling each other, like, st- like ultimate stare down. And we all thought going into this episode that they were going to have to fight. So in I my thought mind. they might fight here. Yeah. I thought this was like a prequel to the fight. they were going to fight up until the end when they were looking at each other from the dock and the ship yeah i, I thought, thought he was gonna have to go through gray worm to get to danny you know like that's what i thought the fight was gonna be like oh, gray worm was gonna be like the, cool. like a boss yep. battle before the big boss you know <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh so yeah like i you know i guess they didn't end up fighting but davos has to remind john here like john you know we should speak with the queen like you're kind of about to commit treason, dude. You know, think about what you're doing here. We're surrounded. We're outnumbered. Um, you know, you got to relax. And John kind of like realizes <laughs> the truth of that and backs down, I guess. And it's just like, God damn, crazy. Anything else you guys want to add about that little scene? It was just intense and sad that I thought to myself when he said that anyone who's breathing that follows Cersei Lannister, it's like, to me, that's the whole Seven Kingdoms at this point because she's their queen. Yeah, it's pretty fucking crazy. She's not really giving the innocent lives a chance to decide, you know, like she did when she roasted Randall and Dick and Tarly. Mm -hmm. Like she gave them a choice either bend the knee or die. Right. And this army that they're slaughtering had already surrendered and, until she yeah. continued the attack, you know, so. So I just felt like it was so um, ominous what was in store for the rest of the seven kingdoms if she were to remain on the throne, because it seems to this point, she's not giving people a choice anymore. If you followed Cersei Lannister, i.e. if you weren't, you know, a traitor, then you're going to die. And it's like most of the kingdom hated Cersei, but she was their queen, so they just kind of tolerated it. So I was very concerned at this point of the mm-hmm. future of all of the all of the people in the Seven Kingdoms. For sure. So next we see Arya who's wandering <laughs> along the outskirts of the city and she looks through this broken wall and sees the Duth Rocky riding around but there's John walking through them. And he doesn't look too stoked because you know, obviously of everything that's happened, but he looks like he's on a mission walking to something. So I was thinking maybe here she like threw on a different face and which she may have worn until she crept up right next to John and like revealed that it was her. But we do see her again with her regular face. (laughs) Uh, So I was like, damn, that would have been cool. Like use, you know, her skills to be undetected. So we get this epic giant stairway stairway leading up to a gate and these massive targaryen sail is like hanging over this ruined um archway arched doorway wall thing that's just destroyed oh my god just (laughs) wrecked right so cool looking like look looks like right out of dark souls and um (laughs) <laughs> and uh, John and starts walking up the stairway and we see like all of the Targaryen forces, the Unsullied and the Dothraki, mostly the Unsullied are just like lined up in their typical fashion of just like an endless sea of order and discipline. And they're lined up along the edges of this staircase um, leading up to this dart, this doorway. And John is walking up and stops and makes eye contact with Grey Worm again for the second epic Grey Worm and John stare down at the episode. And I was like, they're going to have to fight, you know, <laughs> like again, thinking that they're going to fight. That's how I felt the whole time. Yeah. I thought, like, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> totally. 
So this is the moment where they're staring at each other and all of a sudden, rah, and Drogon comes flying overhead and we like his wings are making this Yay! epic sound. I can't do it. My voice is still hoarse. Uh, yeah. And every, be careful. The Death Rocky are all screeching and uh, shrieking, I should say. The shrieking, shriekers is a... Screamers. Screamers. There you go. Screaming. Which I can't emanate right now, sadly, because I lost my <laughs> voice in Vegas. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, John continues to walk up the stairs as Drogon lands beyond the wall here. And right as he, right as his line of sight crosses the barrier at the last step, we see Danny is approaching and it's this epic shot of Drogon's black mm. bat-like wings unfurling oh, around so behind good. Danny and flapping and rising up behind her. God, that was amazing. Yeah, oh. like the black an- wings of the Angel of Death or something uh, super metal. Like the Honest trailer was talking about how like Game of Thrones is like a compilation of epic album art, you know, basically. And... Uh, this is one of those moments where it looks like a metal art, metal album art with like the wings coming from behind Danny yes. and stuff like that. <laughs> so cool. Nice. And uh, so she comes out to give her speech and John takes his place like sort of off to the side. So I've heard people online comparing this speech <laughs> to the General Hux speech from Star Wars. What was it? The Force Awakens, I think it was. With the... Oh, totally. Yeah. With, like, the Nazi-looking guy? (laughs) Yes. The younger guy that looks like... Yeah, he's, like, blonde, I think. He's giving a big speech. It looks like a Nazi rally, basically. Yeah, it looked almost exactly like this one. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and it reminded me of uh, of General Hux in Star Wars. It reminded somebody else. It reminded me of... Hitler <laughs> and uh, and the dictator with Charlie Chaplin, which was like basically about, you know, where Charlie Chaplin essentially plays Hitler. I'm going to put all four of them on screen next to each other. Uh, pretty crazy. So Danny walks forward and starts giving her speech. And she first addresses all of her, her Dothraki. Blood of my blood. <laughs> you kept your promises to me. And she's talking about how they killed her enemies in their iron suits and tore down their stone houses. And isn't this basically what um, Khal Drogo's speech was? And her speech when she was on top of Drogon mm-hmm. to them, when she yeah. asked them to like go across the narrow sea with her. And mm-hmm. I love that they put this in here because it I feel like it reminded the audience like this is what she said like seasons ago. Like tear down their stone houses, basically kill everybody in the iron suits. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. she's always been about this. Yeah, this so it's like new. about it about it. <laughs> for for people that were absolutely blindsided and shocked about last episode that this is a good reminder this is what Drogo promised her. This is what she promised all of her blood riders. Mm-hmm. And this is what she kind of came to Westeros to do and was talked kind of out of it with, you know, her counsel. But this is, this is Danny talking. This is, and then she did what she said she was going to do. So. Right. As Nobody horrible to hold as her it back. Was, yeah. <laughs> as horrible as it was, the writing was on the wall. Yeah, and she it sort of epitomizes with this uh, speech that Dothraki, she, she says, you gave me the seven kingdoms. And at this moment, Drogon like climbs up onto the, the, yeah. the top of the, uh, the right side of the archway, at, like um, opposite of the side that the flag's on. And just Is that rah! like a big sail? Yeah, 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 mm-hmm. sail, sorry. Okay, okay. No, um, I was wondering if it was like a banner or a sail or like what it was. It looked like a sail to me. Yeah, it's so. got to be a sail, right? Only thing that could be that big. I know. That's what I was thinking too. So okay. uh, so she then addresses Grey Worm, Torgo Nudo, you know, and says, you have walked beside me since the Plaza of Pride. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> this all now sounds so Orwellian, like double speak-ish, you know, like war is peace, freedom is slavery type stuff. The, the Plaza yeah. of Pride, which at the time was a fitting name for a good occasion. But since it's led to this, you know, now it's got, you know, it's a whole nother <laughs> connotation t- to that whole event, which is really sad. So she names him the master of war because he's the bravest of men and loyal of most loyal of soldiers. And he looks legit 
like honored by this. You know, he's still fully on Team Danny, obviously. <laughs> and then he he she begins to undre- address the uh, undress b- begins to address the unsullied, <laughs> and uh, speaks to their history as being Go Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, you know, they were all born as slaves and torn from their mother's arms, and now she says they're liberators, which they had been uh, until this. <laughs> More like um, stormtroopers at this point. Mm-hmm. But she's, she says, you've freed the people of King's Landing from the grip of a tyrant. And I'm thinking, like, what people? Are what there the any fuck? people left from <laughs> well, King's there's Landing? There's nobody left. <laughs> yeah, like you may, like we said, you may have freed them from the grip, like right into death's grip, you know? Which would they prefer? Um, and then she continues she to never basically... never gave them a choice. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So she continues basically saying that war is not done. Our spears stay up until we have liberated all the people of the world, you know? And I was like, oh, shit, that's fucked mm-hmm. up. From Winterfell, like Winterfell to Dorn, and the way she said that it sort of sounded German. And Winterfell to Dorn. <laughs> uh-huh. So this speech definitely has like Nazi tones to it to some oh, extent. Oh yeah, the inflections of every word that she said was like da da da, and it was just very, it was creepy, it was eerie. Yeah, it was like very uncomfortable. Yeah, it definitely had a Hitler vibe going. Yeah, oh, yeah, from from Lannisport to Carth, from the Summer Isles to the Jade Sea, and this next line is like the one that really sounded like Hitler to me. She says, "Women, men, and children have suffered too long beneath the wheel," but she's like. Like, like rolling her mm-hmm. R's and like doing the like that Hitler stuff so hard, totally. like shaking her face a little bit, and I was like, oh my god, this is just so crazy. Very Hitlerian delivery of that line, uh, in my opinion. And I was like, just thinking, like, shit, she is ready for more killing. She is not done, you know, at all. She's she's the lion who tasted man. Yeah, to yeah, quote yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. The Savo man eaters. You ever hear of the Savo man eaters? Are those the lions down in like, is it uh, Asia or Korea? No, they were they were two giant male maneless lions that prowled the Savo oh. plains in 1898 when they were constructing a railroad down they there. They made a movie about that. Yeah, Ghost in the Darkness or something. Yes, um, yeah, something Val like Kilmer, that. Val Kilmer, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's oh a crazy God, story. <laughs> they have uh they have like the two skeletons on ex- on exhibit. They're like bigger than normal male lions, but they don't have manes and they killed like 130 people or something that were trying to yeah. <laughs> build this railroad. Crazy. So she's like, will you break the wheel with me? And everybody's cheering, but Arya appears in the crowd and she looks mad as hell. Like, so mad, right? Oh my God, I totally noted that. Like, she looks yeah. pissed. So pissed. having any of it. Uh-huh. And and yeah. Danny just looks like overwhelmed with the power. Like, like she's like, oh, her eyes are wide and she's like soaking it in. And you can see like the resolve on her face. And it just sort of reminded me of that scene in... The scene in Star Wars where Darth Vader is created and Darth Sidious, he, he starts zapping Mace Windu, I think, and he's just like, power, power. <laughs> and that's all I could think of seeing Danny's face in this scene is Darth Sidious. I was like, oh my God, it's so crazy. And uh, so Tyrion approaches from the back, coming out of the Red Keep, I guess, and there's orchestral hits, you know, as he approaches. I thought he was just going to, like, jump up and stab her ass. I know, right? That would have been so crazy. I was wondering the same thing, too. But he, he kind of focused on his footsteps, and then the music turned really dark, and we got kind of this camera angle, like, up over his shoulder, like, looking yeah. at Danny. And no one was really like looking behind her. They were mm-hmm. all kind of looking out. And Nobody was, was like, anywhere oh around God. her. If he's and who'd gonna expect do this? it from the hand? You know? <laughs> yeah, if he's going to do it, this is what you do. So she sees Tyrion approach her right side out of her peripheral vision and turns to him and says, you freed your brother. You committed treason. And she's furious. And Tyrion is like done. <laughs> he is over he's it. He's like, what the fuck? Yeah. yeah, you're right. I freed my brother and you, you slaughtered, slaughtered a city. city. And he did, like, oh, God, slaughtered. Very poignant choice of words. And 
Danny looks. And she looks kind of surprised at this. Yeah, She's like, what? that's what I mean. Like she doesn't even realize I what she's become. Them. Yeah, it's like she doesn't even see the transition that's occurred, and the the look of of disappointment, of true disappointment, across Tyrion's face. Like he's like ashamed for having had any part in it, you know. And just like um, and just like Ned Stark quit when Robert wanted to have Danny assassinated. <laughs> Tyrion quits here, reaches up, and just throws the pin down the stairs. Uh. I'm good, Lord. I thought you were a better man. Out, out, damn you, I'm done with you. Uh. In such like a blatant dis display of disrespect right in front of her whole army during her victory speech. I was like, oh my God, he's about to be killed on well, the yeah, spot. I thought she was going to execute knows. him on the spot. Yeah. He knows. That means like death. He's like, yeah. He's so, uh, he, this is the most honorable thing Tyrion has really done. <laughs> like he's ever. just like, you know what? You know, I'd rather die than have to deal with any of this anymore. Yeah, it's so it insane. so perfect. Yeah, so, and a beautiful shot. It cuts to the back behind the two of them looking down over the army as he rips the pin off and lobs it, like hurls it down the stairs and it clank, 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 bounces across a few of the steps and lands right in front of an unsullied guy's foot. And they're all like, doom, 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 stamp, stomping their like spear butts down onto the ground and they all stop <laughs> at that moment mm -hmm. when it, pin lands well it's kind of like slowly too it's like pump oh okay pump, pump yeah pump. yeah 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 <laughs> yeah one guy stops and then the guy behind him stops and then the guy behind yeah. him stops and it's so quiet you could hear a pin drop the hand of a king pin hand of the queen oh. um <laughs> and uh it's, it's also crazy as uh because Tyrion looks her in the eyes and maintains his eye contact the whole time that he does it like just so she knows he's a hundred percent serious, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, the tension is just incredible at this moment. Um, a like I said, a display of contempt and disrespect, and oh my god, it's even the Dothraki go silent, you know. <laughs> and in High Valyrian, she's just like, take him, and the, the unsullied approach all around him. And a number of times during this episode. Tyrion, the way he looks has reminded me of Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi. Mm. It's like this sort of grisly looking beard and <laughs> sullen facial expressions. Uh, <laughs> just very similar, kind of like defeated um, characters, you know. And uh, He looked like he aged a lot. Yeah, yeah. definitely, definitely. And so he sort of just like walks away towards the keep to towards the dungeons. And as he passes John, he looks up at John, seeing like how John will be react reacting. And John looks crushed. <laughs> he looks so crushed as Tyrion walks by and he can't look at him. But you see his eyes sort of like blink involuntarily. <laughs> and uh, he sort of gaze looks down at the side and watches as Tyrion passes. And uh, then he looks back up. And we see Danny glaring at him in another one of the most intense stare downs of the episode. There are so many. <laughs> and uh, from from what I read on her face, it was disgust and sadness and desire all at once as she sort of sighs and heads back and, and away into the red keep. And I feel like she was mad at John and like disgusted that he seems to be showing sympathy for Tyrion, but mad at him for betraying her, and but sad at the same time that he betrayed her and still desiring him. And she like looks away and sighs, and you can tell that like it's bothering her, and she sort of walks off with their unsullied guard. <laughs> and John just like follows his vision, his gaze just follows her as she walks away, and he looks ultra ultra conflicted and all of a sudden out of nowhere Arya is by his side <laughs> like what <laughs> where did like, you come what are from? you doing here I... I don't even think he realized that she came down from Winterfell oh yeah it's possible no he didn't I don't think he did he was like uh <laughs> I mean she left before him didn't she with the hound 
with the hound yeah yeah uh, so you'd think that he would have like tried to say bye before he left or something but maybe they had just already said goodbye and... well the whole thing was that they had gone without anyone knowing and they were there the whole time without i mean they were there before they were closing the gates and everything no one knew they were there right true right yeah definitely I, yeah <laughs> so uh she i was wondering like because she got up to him so like stealthily i may i thought maybe she had like put on another face to get up there like proposed as a dothraki or an unsullied or something <laughs> but maybe not maybe she just goes invisible or something we don't know what she does so she she's yeah. quiet as a cat quiet as a cat yes um silent as a shadow yeah right <laughs> so um He's like, what are you doing here? You know, like, what? Oh, and he sees that she's all injured and like disheveled looking. And he's like, what happened? And she tells him point blank, I came to kill Cersei. Your, but your queen got there first. She's everyone's queen now. She's like, um, try telling Sansa that. Yeah. She'll freaking slap you across she's the face. not having yeah. it. She's like, you're cute. You're cute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he's like, oh, he like, but he says, wait for me outside the city gates. I'll come and find, I'll come find you. And um, she gives him a dire warning here. This is a warning that Ned Stark never got about Cersei. That if he had, like, knew what she was capable of, maybe he would have acted instead of doing nothing. That fateful night in King's Landing, you know what I mean? Um, she tells him, John, she knows who you are, who you really are. You'll always be a threat to her. And I know a killer when I see one. And I was just like, oh, shit, dude. Like, she she should know a killer at this point. <laughs> like, spending time with a hound and with faceless men and stuff like that. It's crazy. It was just so intense. Um, it, it's just sad that Ned never got a similar warning, you know? It took Arya and Tyrion both to plead with Jon to get him to do what needed to be done. But uh, Renly, his his pleading with Ned just wasn't enough, I guess, to, to spur Ned into action. Unfortunately, he had no idea what Cersei was capable of. Like I was, you know, like I said, I'm just glad that John didn't get his head locked off the same way for acting the same way that Ned does. I know. Yeah. right? Just oblivion. Yeah. Well, at least oh, John acted queen. in this case. Mm -hmm. Finally, finally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anything else you guys want to add about this amazingly epic speech scene or anything the no. visuals were just amazing to me I, truly I, I can't even with yeah that's true it just felt like you could you could be there you could hear every breath you could hear see every it was just amazing to me they did a great job and just all the destruction and devastation in the I distance the beyond the troops. flying everywhere yeah the ash just dropping everywhere well and that's the oh. intention to detail like the the banner or the sail just flowing in the wind and then when drogon comes up it flows a little faster when they move it was they paid attention to every little detail <laughs> so, so awesome happy. I'm so happy with it yeah me too so good all right so what do we got next we have um Telling John, yeah, he's going Grey to the Worm says watch. that that Tyrion's Tyrion's punishment as Hand of the King isn't enough, and we cut to Tyrion then meeting with John in his cell, and uh, <laughs> explaining what happened. Giving you to the Unsullied would start a war. Letting you walk free would start a war. So our new king has chosen to send you to the Night's Watch. And he's just There's like... There's still a Night's Watch? <laughs> yeah, he's like, what? <laughs> Which we speculated, Duncan, a couple episodes yeah, ago. We were, we're like, what happened that. to the Night's Watch? <laughs> um, somebody pointed out, if the bit, the main part of the deal was the Unsullied, you know, being pissed off, then the Unsullied leave at the end of this episode. They all go to Noth, right? So, like, what's the point of even, you know, like, <laughs> negotiating with them? I mean, I maybe guess they some of them stayed. Maybe. And I guess Yara, Greyjoy, and other people were still mad that John killed Danny. So I yeah. guess that was a problem, too. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny, though. So John looks disheveled and rough, like probably the worst we've seen him look at all. A hot mess. Yeah, he looks like just weighed down, you know, by guilt. It looks like he just killed the love of his life. Yeah, and his <laughs> eyes are all like swollen and he just looks fucked, man. It sucks. And uh, he's he like, looks stinky. He looks like he stinks a little bit. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and uh, you know, he's like, "There's still a night's watch." And uh, Tyrion says, "The world will always need a home for bastards and broken men." And uh, so I guess, even, you know, even if the Night King has been defeated, uh, it's you never know. Dead shit could pop off again at any moment, I guess, right? So you got to just be ready for it and ever vigilant. But at least now it seems like they'll have plenty of word, plenty of time and word of it, like ahead of any attack from people that are living beyond the wall now that are friends of the realm. So that's mm-hmm. exciting. It's own like whole new safe kingdom now up there. It's pretty, pretty, pretty cool. And I love how Tyrion sighs here and he's like, ah, you shall take no wife, hold no lands, <laughs> father no children. He's and like, John's I know like, the oath. I know Dude. this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Unsullied wanted your head, of course, but Grey Worm has accepted the justice of a life sentence. And of course, Sansa and Arya wanted him freed, but they understood the new king needed to make peace. And this is that great line that you mentioned <laughs> earlier. No one is very happy, which means it's a good compromise, I suppose. I suppose. <laughs> which is, the, typically, that's actually like a real thing, you know, that you know that yeah. it's a good deal when nobody's yeah. happy. <laughs> Especially in like business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is when you can tell what is what has John so upset as he starts asking Tyrion, was it right? What I did? And uh, Tyrion tries to offset some of the guilt by taking it, some of it onto himself, you know, and he's what we did. And um, it it does not enough to help John, though. He's like, it doesn't feel right, which sucks, man. He's really struggling with this. It's, It's gotta be such a horrible position. Like when love and duty are both like the the desire and responsibility for each is so intense and you have to choose one at the cost of the other like period you can't salvage both um it's horrible for sure you know so uh john tells Tyrion he's that he's like i don't expect we'll ever see each other again <laughs> but Tyrion's not so sure <laughs> he says a few ha- a, a few, few years, years. Of, <laughs> yeah a few years of hand would make anyone want to piss off the edge of the world <laughs> As we know, he loves that. Yeah, great season one callback to their initial journey up to the wall together. Which there's so many season one callbacks, and this one closer. It's it's they did such a great job. The way the knights men like walked him out of there too. Yeah, like the way he looked at him, like okay, (sighs) I know what the fuck this means. We're going. Yep. Or the way they're dressed, like the costumes almost look like season one costumes. They really took us back and well, made so much sense. Yeah, exactly. That's right where we are, too. John comes out of the dungeon to the mm-hmm. uh, the Danny and John theme playing sadly, showing he's carrying the burden with him every step as he walks down the stairs. We see that there's two Night's Watch, Night's Watch guys, and then there's a bunch of ships with black flags. Are, do you think they're all sending prisoners up to the Night's Watch? I thought those were the um, Unsullied going to North. Oh, maybe it was. Yeah, I was just confused because I. I they, it must be. Yeah, that's because John and them, me, they ride It could be a north. combination of both. It's just John and the two um, Black brothers that arrive at the wall together, though. So it doesn't seem like mm. any of those ships are related, right? Right. Um, yeah. So yeah, it must be must be the unsullied. But it was interesting. They're black flags. I first thought was, oh, they're gonna fly out. They're fly. They're gonna sail to White Harbor or whatever, and or sail to Eastwatch and then ride along the wall. What color are Yara's uh, sails? Good question. I assume it would be black with the golden kraken. Black and gold. Okay. Yeah, right here. Black with the golden kraken. <laughs> I got yeah. it behind me right now. Oh nice. Oh, there you go. Your cool flags. I saw that. That was yeah. awesome. <laughs> I didn't see that. That was my mom. She's like. She's nerdy for me. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> nice. So, yeah, black with a golden kraken. Perfect. So, do you guys know the historical meaning of a black flag? No. Uh, no. Pirates would fly black flags because, you know, all different flags have meanings. White flag, for instance, which is the opposite of black. What's a white flag? It's a surrender. So, yeah. given that black is the opposite of a black fla- of a white flag, what would a black flag mean? Conquering. 
not exactly more direct just no surrender killing <laughs> pillaging <laughs> murder. raping murder black, black flag means we will not surrender like we will fight to the uh, death basically oh. and then when you add the skull and crossbones it means we take no prisoners we will not surrender and we will take no prisoners add red eyes or a bloody heart it means we will also t will torture you uh so interesting. Oh my god, my son should not be playing a lot of the games that he plays on Roblox then. Because <laughs> I see all those. <laughs> well, the they, you know, the meanings have changed over time. Nobody like follows that <laughs> <Okay>. anymore. <laughs> but a cool little fun <laughs> historical fact, right? Yeah, I didn't know that. No that surrender. Cool. Yeah, I love it. So what do we have next? The the scene with Brienne filling in Jamie's page in the white book? Oh man. Yeah. Yes. Immediately. I think that's my last note. Too. nice yeah i think yeah. yeah same here um immediately i was super excited because i recognized the room i was like oh my god brand's lord commander of the king's guard it's so cool right uh, which i thought was interesting because you almost would have expected her like we talked about to be sansa's queen's guard right so she must have sent her to take mm -hmm. care of Bran since he was more I think physically that's the most logical. incapable. Yeah, <laughs> same here. But it's also really fitting for Brienne to be Lord Commander of the King's Guard of the Seven or Six Kingdoms now, because her ancestor, Sir Duncan the Tall, was Aegon the Fifth's Lord Commander of his King's Guard. Well, there you go. Yeah, so it's in her mm -hmm. genes, you know. Like it just makes perfect sense and was a great right. homage. Totally, I love yeah. that connection. Nice. You know, I love those stories anyway. <laughs> yeah, so good. I love that she sat down and gave Jamie kind of the respect that he was due as a fighter and a warrior. Yeah. And didn't make it like personal. She was very matter of fact with what she had on that on that page yeah exactly everything that she did like she didn't let it get personal and let their interactions with each other ruin um his reputation she i think in the end realized that it was like a heroin addiction with him like we mentioned right with cersei just got dragged back into it as much as he was trying to get out of it and i think on some level she still respects him and sees him as an honorable person so I do too. She, so I mean, he went on his whole rant of things that he had confessed to her previously, um, like when he left Winterfell. And she, given all that anyway, she still only like gives him credit for good stuff here. Like he was like, I would have killed every man, woman and child in River Run to get back to Cersei, you know. But the first line that she adds took River Run from the Tully rebels without loss of life. You know, it's like so, yeah. so awesome the way she spins all this to be really good. Lured the unsullied. Sacrificing his childhood home in service yeah. to a greater strategy. Yeah, luring the unsullied into attacking Casterly Rock. That's so crazy. Outwitting the Targaryen forces to seize High Garden. Fought at the Battle of the Gold Road bravely, narrowly escaping death I by love dragon how they fire. It the Gold Road. Yeah, the pretty cool, road, right? Yeah. <laughs> Pledged himself to the forces of men and rode north rode to north join them to join at Winterfell. Them at Winterfell. Yes. Amazing. Alone faced the army of the dead and defended the castle against impossible odds until the death of the night king and then he died protecting his queen escaped imprisonment yeah and south in an attempt to save the capital from destruction oh. died protecting his queen mm, oh, i loved man. that last line because it was his queen but also like the queen of his heart you know mm -hmm. yeah and she Cersei. also like she, she gave him a little it. more credit than he really deserved because he didn't save he didn't necessarily go back to try to save the capital from destruction well, i mean i guess he did yeah yeah we can we could say he did. But, but you think about <clears throat> who his queen was yeah it, it it's it's up for <laughs> yeah yep cersei totally so that it, she pauses for a yeah. second and we see her like that. contemplating what she's about to write and then finally like deciding to do it and <laughs> died protecting his queen and she like oh she has like a little half smile on her face too. Yeah, she's, she's like she felt yeah. good about it was almost like a little bit of therapy for her. Right. Like she's she's upset about everything that happened, but taking the high road, I think, made her feel good and giving him uh, you know, the dues that he deserved and not succumbing to anger, I think. She was probably proud of herself for overcoming that and um doing a, a good job as Lord Commander and doing the honorable thing and taking the high and road shows basically. That shows her growth as a character, too. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, yeah, she closes the book and 
has like a look of sadness, but also like a little bit of contentment in there as well. Um, you know, that, she'll always be carrying kind of a piece of him with her because she carries Oathkeeper. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he knighted her. So <laughs> and he knighted her, pe- and he yeah. stole her flower. As long as she's a <laughs> sir, <laughs> as long as she's a sir, uh, she carries a piece of him with her. Yeah, you know, very she, very poetic. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, so I thought that was a nice scene and appreciated Brienne's honor and everything in there and. Oh, and so, okay, so that's pretty much the end of the, our notes, right? Yes, I think it's time to go on to Ravens. Oh, right, yeah. I guess just closing closing thoughts on the season and the series as a whole. Um, what do you guys think? Go ahead, Princess Sarah. I am very happy with it. I mean, you know, the only thing that I could, ever, I could say about um, the season is it felt fast. But the way that they made up for the quickness was balancing everything out and making sense of a lot of things that, you know, who else would have been able to do that in like six episodes? <laughs> yeah. It made sense to me. It was okay. I, like, I think I said before, I, I was really nervous about it ending. Like I thought I was going to be really upset, really emotionally scarred mm-hmm. almost. But when it ended, I was like, no, this is good. This is all good. This is exactly how it was supposed to happen. And it makes sense. So I'm good. Awesome. How about you, Lady Rachel? I think from the very beginning of the series to the very end, we had many different types of seasons. Um, They started off a little bit slower to to develop. to develop the story. I think they started to pick up a little bit, you know, around season five, six and seven, and then season eight. I wish they would have had a little bit more time to develop the ending just because the beginning was so detailed. However, with the time that they did have, I think they did a phenomenal job and I couldn't have been happier with the ending. I was thinking like, could I want it a different way? Would I want to see John on the throne? Would I want to see Danny on the throne? And the answer is the way they wrapped it up for me personally. They tied in the first episode, the pilot episode, to many aspects of the last episode here that we're talking about today. I think they just did a phenomenal job, and I can't thank the cast and crew enough for giving us something that will be transcendent through time and allow us to rewatch and rewatch again and speculate and form our own theories about where these characters are now. Nice. That's what I say. I say I'm so excited to rewatch it. I yeah. can't Me wait too. to rewatch it with the knowledge that we have now and yeah. just make so much more sense of it because it's so beautiful. So good. What about you, Duncan? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the anticipation was crazy to see what they ended up doing. But, I, you know, from perspective of having carefully dissected this series, I think that they really did justice to a lot of things. And although there were other things that we were left out, that we could have gotten. I think that given the time and resources that they had, that they did really well. And um, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I enjoyed it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, that's the best way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> I am so glad I enjoyed it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Me too. All right. So we'll be right back, guys, after a short break with Raven's Calls. Make sure to check out the new Game of Thrones rap album, The Iron Throne of Microphones, by Purpose, from the rap group Tragic Allies. Just go to tragicallies.bandcamp.com to get the album for free today. This track is called First of His Name. A wise man once said, The true history of the world is a history of great conversations in elegant rooms. Who said this? Me, just now. You can quote me, I kneel for no king Wear gold rings and I do drink and no things The oath keep a disperser of pain First of its name, preordained, no purpose will reign, yo And you can quote me, I kneel for no king Wear gold rings and I do drink and no things The oath keep a disperser of pain First of its name, preordained, no purpose will reign, yo From this day until my last day, I'm trying to fight For this life, I paid the iron price Escaping the lion's bite, divide and strike In different places, my men are faceless Leave no traces, poison at is tasteless master of the water dances patience provokes greatness foes be hating because they mostly basic kill a soldier and see ghostly traces move through the sky man who sees nothing really has no use for his eyes 
Sick him with the pointy end till he dies. It's a murderous trend. There are things to even learn from the dead. They said a monster is and even dying inside. But monsters are dangerous and kings are dying like flies. I on the prize, be quiet, observe. Some wounds are never truly heal and bleed again. At the slightest of words, it's cast in doubt. The day will come when you think you're safe and happy and the joy will turn to ash in your mouth. Quote me, I kneel for no king Wear gold rings and I do drink and no things The oath keep a disperser of pain First of his name, preordained, no purpose to reign Yo, and you can quote me, I kneel for no king Wear gold rings and I do drink and no things The oath keep a disperser of pain First of his name, preordained, no purpose to reign Yo, I'm tough as grayscale, most fear me and nail I break the wheel with valerian steel Mass appeal, no mistake in the face Women getting naked for a taste of greatness When I'm making it Eight. So I spend my time warring and whoring And when I actually stop, they're begging from Dawn and Castle Rock Capture me not, the dagger's fast crafted with dragon glass But fear cuts deeper than swords from an assassin slash Rather that than how they ass trying to plot Chaos is a ladder, so I had to climb to the top For the realm, I wear my honor like a suit of armor You must be new to karma if you try pursuing drama So may the gods forgive me and my soldiers serving me Power tastes best when it's sweetened by the courtesy Certainly, those who try to murder me are caught and slain What do we say to the gods? Of death, not today, walk away. And you can quote me, I kneel for no king. Wear gold rings and I do drink and no things. The oath keep a disperser of pain, first of its name. Preordained, no purpose to reign, yo. And you can quote me, I kneel for no king. Wear gold rings and I do drink and no things. The oath keep a disperser of pain, first of its name. Preordained, no purpose to reign, yo.